What you're looking at is the Flammarion engraving. This famous artwork of anonymous origins features a rather unusual view of the cosmos. In the book where it first appeared, it's accompanied by a passage that tells the story of a medieval missionary who, during one of his voyages to the east, in search for the biblical Garden of Eden, he reached the horizon where the earth and the heavens met and discovered a certain point where they were not joined together. By stooping right under the loose edge of the heavens and looking through this gap, he saw the outermost ethereal realm that exists beyond our world. The ancient authors of the Old Testament imagined an almost identical universe, a universe made up of three layers. A flat, disc-shaped earth, in Hebrew called Ha'aretz, heaven or Shamayim, above, and the underworld, a physical place located below the surface of earth named Sheol. Humans inhabited earth during life and Sheol after death, but there was no way mortals could ever enter heaven. It's an idea borrowed from the ancient Sumerian religion dictating that heaven was reserved exclusively for the gods. This three-layer structure is quite evident from the following commandment in the book of Exodus. Thou shalt not make unto thee any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. Here's where it gets a bit confusing. Which body of water below earth is this verse talking about? It starts to make sense when you know that this three-part world floated inside a mythological cosmic ocean referred to in Hebrew as Tehom, translated in English as the deep. See, in ancient creation myths of the Near East, there was a common theme that the universe was formed out of vague, pre-existing pool of matter commonly thought to be an endless, chaotic, cosmic ocean. In Sumerian mythology, for instance, this cosmic ocean is personified as the eternally existing goddess, Namu, who gave birth to heaven and earth. In the Babylonian creation epic, Enuma Elish, this primordial ocean of chaos is personified as the goddess Tiamat, who battles against the supreme god, Anu, but is eventually subdued by the god Marduk, who slit this huge serpent into two parts. The upper half of her body formed the heavens, and the lower became the bedrock of earth. Now, the creation account in the book of Genesis has its own primordial ocean too, that is, Tehom, which appears in the opening lines of the Bible. Genesis begins with God creating the heavens and the earth, and his spirit hovering in the darkness upon this ancient restless body of water. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Unlike every other created thing, nowhere does Genesis specifically state that God created this ocean, which may imply it had existed eternally, just like its counterparts in these other ancient cultures. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, we can find two distinct narratives for how the God of the Israelites created the cosmos either by speaking stuff into existence right away, or by engaging in a cosmic battle against the monsters of chaos first. This later model is referred to by scholars as the Chaos Kampf. In the Logos, or speech alone narrative found in Genesis, God only speaks and formless matter emerges into existence. Each creative act begins with a spoken command, and ends by giving the new entity a name, because in the ancient world, things did not officially exist until they were assigned a specific name. Creation by speech is not unique to the Old Testament though, it's also found in some ancient Egyptian traditions. Now, in the Chaos Kampf model, Yahweh goes to war against the monsters of the cosmic sea at the beginning of time in order to establish his sovereignty first, 
before creating anything. In this version of events, Tehum is regarded as the arch enemy of God, being home to the fearsome monsters which he battled and conquered before creating the world. By his power he stilled the sea, by his understanding he smote Rahab. Rahab is the Hebrew sea monster that represents the primordial powers of chaos. This creature is believed by Old Testament scholars to be another name for Leviathan, the terrifying multi-headed sea serpent slain by Yahweh at the dawn of time. Psalm 74 captures a scene from this epic battle. You it was who smashed sea with your might, who battered the heads of the monsters in the waters. You it was who crushed the heads of Leviathan. In this worldview, which is found mostly in Psalms and Job, the seas are primordial forces of disorder, and Yahweh has to conquer them first to set the stage for his act of creation. He battles chaos, personified in the primordial sea, to whom and Leviathan, its formidable denizen. Nature joins the fray against the chaos waters alongside the supreme deity, Yahweh, and upon his victory, he sits enthroned on a divine mountain above the firmament, surrounded by lesser deities. He then speaks, bringing forth the created world. This myth was adopted later in Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature and projected into the future, where a similar cosmic battle is scheduled to take place at the end of our world's history. We see in the book of Revelation how Michael and his angels wage war upon the dragon which shall be defeated. This dragon is believed to be a reference to Leviathan of the Old Testament and to Tiamat, the chaos ocean in Babylonian myth before it. It's also the same creature that early church fathers identified as their own version of the ultimate enemy, Satan. So Revelation tells us that after God's final victory over the sea monster, a new heaven and a new earth shall be established and there will be, quote, no more sea. I used to wonder why would God have a problem with seas in particular. Knowing what we've just discussed, it makes perfect sense as to why. In the new heavens, Yahweh's ancient enemy, the sea, along with its monsters of chaos, will be defeated once and for all. From lakes and rivers to the vast oceans, all bodies of water on the surface of the disk of earth were believed by the ancient Hebrews to originate from the nether waters of Tehom. Many legends have emerged over centuries around Tehom in rabbinical Jewish traditions, like when King David was preparing the foundations for the temple in Jerusalem and, while digging, he went too far that he reached the Tehom waters below the earth. This caused a large stream of water to erupt, threatening to flood the world. In response to this impending apocalypse, a sage named Ahitophel advised him to carve the sacred name of Yahweh on a shard of pottery, then throw it into the hole out of which the water erupted. The name is composed of four Hebrew letters and is sometimes referred to by the very cool sounding name Tetragrammaton. Once David threw the shard into the waters, they immediately receded. Another legend recounts how every year on Rosh Kachodesh Tevat, a Jewish feast that marks the winter solstice, the darkest day of the darkest month of the year, Leviathan emerges from the deep and roars loudly, serving as an annual reminder of the chaos waters out of which the world began. Now, as we have seen so far, in the early Old Testament period, the earth was thought to be a flat disk floating on water. But what kept the earth fixed in place inside the waters of Tehom? This landmass was believed to be supported from beneath by pillars referred to throughout the Hebrew Bible as the foundations or pillars of the earth. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. 
The number of these pillars hasn't been precisely determined, however. Some sources cite one, others say seven or twelve pillars. It's also not clear what these pillars are themselves resting on. Some texts suggest that they rest upon another layer of water, the water upon mountains, the mountains upon the wind, and the wind upon a storm, but this is likely an allegory of some sort. A similar layered structure can be found in later Islamic myth as well. al Kazwini speaks of an earth that is shouldered by an angel standing on a sheet of precious stone, on a cosmic bull, all supported by a gargantuan fish called Bahamut, which likely derives from the Hebrew Behemoth. The author might have confused Behemoth, a large monster that lived on land, with Leviathan, which dwelt in the depths of Tehom. The earth also has tunnels, opening into the deep Tehom beneath. These are the fountains of the deep, mentioned in the flood narrative where much of the flood waters came from in Genesis 7:11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Rain fell on earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this whole concept of a flat earth is quite similar to one depicted in this ancient Babylonian world map from the year 600 BCE. It shows a single circular continent surrounded by a circular sea, and beyond the sea, a number of equally spaced triangles called Nagu that could be either mountains or uncharted islands. These were thought to be very distant, unreachable regions lying beyond the edge of existence. As we go down beneath the surface of the Earth's disk, there lies Sheol, the dwelling place of the Rephaim, or Shades. While the light shone upon Earth, a thick veil of darkness covered Sheol. On Earth, the living had solid bodies, but in Sheol, the dead existed as mere shadows. Sheol is mentioned 66 times throughout the Hebrew Bible where it's associated with a sense of eternal finality. Once you go there, your consciousness ceases to exist, no surviving soul or life after death. Those in Sheol remember nothing, not even Yahweh. Yet there was a glimmer of hope for these forsaken souls. A person who was properly mourned by his relatives after death was believed to be able to join his departed ancestors in Sheol. In some accounts, the souls in Sheol only slept, while in others they existed in hopelessness and fear. In the earliest period of the Old Testament, Sheol was simply a universal grave or a subterranean pit that has gates lying below the waters of the deep. It's a dark cavern where all dead humans go regardless of being good or wicked, rich or poor. Now, these characteristics of a shadowy afterlife were not unique to the ancient Israelite community. The Babylonians had a very similar underworld to Sheol called Aralu, and the ancient Sumerians believed that upon their death, regardless of their behavior while alive, they would go to Kur, a cold and dark cavern located deep beneath the earth ruled by the goddess of death, Ereshkigal, and there, the only food available is dry dust. In the book of Isaiah, we get to know more of the disturbing side of Sheol, with Isaiah describing it as possessing an ever-increasing appetite for living men, its favorite victims being the souls of the sinners. It's a place where the cries for mercy to Yahweh cannot escape. Perhaps this disturbing scene contributed to the grotesque medieval depictions of hell as a gaping jaw devouring sinners alive in large numbers. One strange verse in the Bible implies that the dead in Sheol are in some sense semi-divine apparitions, like the shade of prophet Samuel, referred to as Elohim in the first book of Samuel, 
the same word used for God and gods. In this verse, Samuel, an inhabitant of Sheol, was summoned to King Saul to the domain of the living by the witch of Endor, which may suggest that those in Sheol, or at least a mere shadow of them, could sometimes be called back to earth. However, this practice of necromancy is an offense under Jewish law and was strictly forbidden. During the Second Temple period, when many theological conceptions evolved further under Zoroastrian influence, the Book of Enoch divided Sheol into four compartments. The first was a well-lit cavern with a shiny spring of fresh water for the righteous souls to survive on as they happily awaited the Day of Judgment. The second for those who were a little less moral in life, but not quite sinful either, to await their final reward. The third compartment was reserved for murder victims to await justice to be served, and the final chamber was a dark crevice for the punishment of the wicked. This last one gave birth to the later Jewish idea of Gehenna, or hell as we know it today, in which the evil souls are tormented forever with actual fire. Leaving behind Haaretz, the realm of mortals, let's investigate the intricate lore of the heavens and paradise in the ancient Hebrew traditions. In the Old Testament, the word Shamayim can mean both the sky or atmosphere and also the dwelling place of God. A distinct structure fashioned by Yahweh during creation, called the firmament, was the solid transparent dome covering the earth. See, the ancient Israelites believed that the earth's disk was submerged under the cosmic ocean at the very beginning. God then created the solid structure, the firmament, to drive a wedge in the Tehom waters, separating them into upper and lower portions the upper being the portion of waters above the firmament, and the lower, the portion below it. In the verse following this one, Yahweh would gather together the portion of the waters under the firmament into what we call seas and oceans, so that dry land could emerge. The firmament, or rakia, as it's called in Hebrew, had since then enclosed the earth, protecting it from the surrounding cosmic waters. Like all peoples of the ancient Near East, the early Hebrews believed that the sun, moon, planets, and stars were embedded in the firmament, kind of like pins in a pincushion. These celestial bodies were worshipped as deities at multiple points throughout history, a practice which the Bible considers mortal sin. Jewish sources tell us that the firmament is a dome-shaped layer measuring two or three fingers in thickness, always lustrous and never tarnishing. Some argued it was made of congealed water, something like jelly in consistency, not so solid, yet not liquid like the water surrounding it either. Moses ben Nachman, a distinguished medieval Jewish scholar, seems to confirm this idea, as he quotes from the ancient rabbis that the heavens were in a fluid form on the first day, and on the second day, they solidified. Early Christian writers were also quite intrigued by the nature of the firmament and speculated about the material from which it could possibly be made. Some said it was made of a transparent solid, like glass or ice, and the blue color of the sky we see is that of the primordial waters surrounding this transparent dome from the outside. A famous medieval scholar by the name of Bede believed that the firmament had the firmness of crystalline stone. But this interpretation posed a bit of a logical challenge, which is that the celestial bodies cannot travel within solid matter. That's why others like Saint Basil rejected the notion that the firmament was made of a solid. Some reliable sources from the Talmud state that the diameter of the firmament is equal to the distance covered in 500 years at a marching pace. The distance of the firmament from Earth also happens to be a walking journey of 500 years. 
The firmament extended down to and kissed the extreme edges of the earth at the horizon, where it was believed to be supported either by the mountains or upon invisible pillars. After all, it was a physical structure that required something to support it from below in order not to fall down on earth. We can find the same logic in countless mythologies in nearly every ancient civilization. The ancient Egyptians thought that the sky was a physical roof supported by pillars, and for the Sumerians, tin was the metal of heaven, so perhaps their sky vault was made out of this material. Greek poet Homer believed the sky is a metal hemisphere covering a flat earth, and as far east as ancient Tibet, a heavenly dome made of iron can be found. But if heaven was so solid, how can rain, for example, come in? The elements of nature like rain, snow, wind and hail were thought by the Hebrews to be kept in storehouses or heavenly cisterns outside the rakia, which had windows or openings to allow them in. Remember Genesis 7-11? The waters for Noah's flood entered earth when the windows of heaven were opened. So when we think about it, the flood makes perfect sense in the context of this primitive cosmology where the earth is submerged in an endless body of water. As waters erupted from the fountains of the deep below and the windows in the firmament opened to let the waters in from above, water can easily fill the whole earth up to the mountaintops as the story says because you basically have an infinite supply of water from this outer ocean. This is also why the flood is hard to make sense of when we try to reconcile it with our science-based cosmology, as this enormous amount of water is simply impossible to account for in today's model. Now high on top of the firmament lies God's throne. Psalm 29 describes God sitting enthroned over the flood, aka the cosmic sea, in his heavenly palace. He is the eternal king who walks on the vault of heaven and lays the foundations of his heavenly chambers in the waters. So if you were to look up from earth, you would technically be seeing the floor of God's throne room through this transparent firmament. Ancient Israelites believed that the throne itself was fashioned from a blue precious stone called lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is a deep blue metamorphic rock that was highly prized since antiquity for its intense, mesmerizingly beautiful color. During the late Middle Ages in Europe, lapis lazuli was ground into powder and made into a blue pigment called ultramarine. It was the most expensive pigment available followed only by gold, and was reserved solely for depicting the robes of angels and the Virgin Mary. When the early Israelites looked up to the heavens, they not only saw what they believed was the underside of Yahweh's throne, but also countless celestial bodies scattered across the firmament. Multiple medieval traditions credit the invention of astronomy to ancient Old Testament characters like Adam, Seth, or Enoch. Jewish historian Flavius Josephus believed that Seth, who was the third son of Adam and Eve, preserved ancient astronomical knowledge in pillars of stone. Yet only a handful of star groups are named in the Hebrew Bible. The clearest references are to a constellation named Kima which could be the Pleiades, located in constellation Taurus. There is also Xil, which scholars believe is the constellation Orion, and Mezarim, which may refer to Ursa Major. The study of astronomy following the Babylonian exile was one of the most valued endeavors a Jewish scholar could undertake, and sometimes it was even regarded as religious duty. Some writers go as far as to claim that you can compute the course of the sun and the revolution of the planets and neglects to do so, to him may be applied the words of the prophet Isaiah, they regard not the work of the Lord, 
nor consider the operation of his hands. So, yeah, to pay attention to these intricacies of nature amounted to a religious command. But despite this apparent significance of astronomy in Jerusalem, not many developments in astronomy happened there during the Talmudic period. The starry heavens of the land of Israel was more an object of interest to the Jews as creations of God and as means to determine the holidays than a domain of scientific innovation. Now speaking of holidays, keeping track of important events was a key aspect in the study of astronomy among the Jews because sacred dates and times of year were based upon the cycles of the sun and moon. The Talmud associated the 12 constellations of the zodiac with the 12 months of the Hebrew calendar, and some scholars identified the 12 signs of the zodiac with the 12 tribes of Israel. Apart from the sun and moon, a few other heavenly bodies could not go unnoticed as well. Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah declared that a star appears once every 70 years and leads mariners astray. So he advised that when this happens, they should store a larger amount of provisions in case they get lost at sea. Little did he know it at the time that he was talking about Halley's Comet. One of the most popular frameworks of astronomy back then was the geocentric model, which states that the Earth is the center of the universe and all heavenly bodies revolve around it. For instance, the Sun was thought to complete its course around Earth in 12 months, Jupiter in 12 years, Saturn in 30 years, and Venus and Mars in 480 years. Yes, it sounds illogical now, but from the perspective of a simple earthbound wanderer at the time, Earth seems to be so stable and fixed in place. That's why the geocentric concept made perfect sense back then. Fun fact, legend had it that at the time of the flood, the sun traveled opposite to its usual trajectory, rising in the west and setting in the east. We can't talk about astronomy without mentioning the number 7, which happens to be a recurring numerical theme throughout the Hebrew Bible. Creation took place in seven days, the Passover is a feast that lasts seven days, and the very first line of Bereshit, aka the book of Genesis, consists of seven words in its original Hebrew. The number was held in equally high regard in astronomy too. The seven lamps of the menorah correspond to the lights of the seven classical planets found in Hebrew astronomy, namely the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, yes, that was considered a planet too, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Jupiter, or Tzedek, meant righteousness. Saturn is called Shabbatai in Hebrew, a term closely linked to Shabbat, the Hebrew word for Saturday and the holiest day of the week. Mars, Ma'adim, means the red one. The sun was considered a fiery planet and thus was called Chama, meaning the hot one. Venus, or Kochevet, meant the she planet, or the bright one, being the most clearly visible from Earth. Mercury is Kochav, simply means the planet. And finally, the moon, called Levana, or the white one. Unlike other nations who attributed divine powers to these seven planets and derived the names of the seven weekdays from them, Jewish rabbis, despite also being familiar with such planets and their characteristics in astrology, opposed any reference to their worship. The result is that, to this day, weekdays have no official names in Hebrew aside from Sabbath. Instead, each day is referred to by the number of its order in the calendar. For example, Sunday is called first day, and Monday is the second day, and so on. Technically speaking, the word Shamayim 
can mean either one or multiple heavens. It's likely that during the early period of the Old Testament, Jews believed in only one heaven. The Babylonians, on the other hand, had a more complex idea of heaven. So, during the exile in the 6th century BCE, Jewish theology was heavily influenced by Babylonian beliefs, which led to the idea of multiple heavens amongst the Jews. In several mythological cosmologies, the idea that the earth is surrounded by seven heavens is quite a common one, and ancient Mesopotamian religions are the earliest to mention this concept. They regarded the sky as a series of seven concentric domes covering the flat earth, and each dome was made of a different precious stone. Shemayim in the Hebrew Bible is the dwelling place of God, alongside other heavenly beings, and during the course of the first millennium CE, Jewish scholars developed an elaborate system of seven heavens, each with a specific name, angel presiding over it, and heavenly beings inhabiting it. The first of these heavens, named Vilon, is governed by Archangel Gabriel. It's the nearest heavenly realm to Earth. You can also find Adam and Eve living here. Rakia, the name of the second heaven, is controlled by Archangel Raphael. It was in this heaven that Moses, during an alleged visit to Paradise, encountered an extraordinary angel called Nuriel, who measured 300 parasangs tall with a retinue of 50 myriads of angels all fashioned out of water and fire. Rakia is also the realm where the fallen angels are imprisoned and the planets and stars are fixed, as we saw earlier. The third heaven, called Shahakim, falls under the leadership of Archangel Haniel. It serves as the home of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. It is also the realm where manna, the holy food of angels, is produced and stored. The fourth heaven, named Maon, is ruled by Archangel Michael, and according to the Talmud, it contains the heavenly Jerusalem along with its temple and altar. Mahon, the fifth heaven, is said to be under the administration of Samael. It's where the Ishim reside. In Judaism, Ishim, which literally translates to man-like beings, are considered the lowest rank of angels. These messengers talk directly with human prophets, appearing as totally ordinary people without illumination or any supernatural features, hence their name. In the book of Genesis, a story goes that three of these Ishim visited Abraham, talked to him, dined with him, and all the while he never realized they were actually angels. Yeah, that's how not interesting they were. Moving on, the sixth heaven, Zvul, falls in the domain of the archangel Zadkiel. It's where decisions regarding earthly matters and what happens in certain places are made. And finally, Aravut, the seventh heaven, under the leadership of archangel Cassiel, is the holiest of all seven, as it houses the throne of God attended by all seven archangels and serves as the realm in which God dwells. Ezekiel 1 describes a magnificent vision of God's throne, made of lapis lazuli and resting on flying angels. Cherubim, hybrid human-animal creatures with four different faces and four wings each, and Ophanim, angelic structures made up of interlocking wheels full of eyes all along the rims. Multitudes of angels can be seen to the right and left of God, described as being like prosecutors and defendants to the right and left of a judge. Now this next part gets even more interesting. Under the throne of God lie all the unborn human souls. According to Jewish mythology, in paradise there is a tree of souls which continually grows new souls. The ripe souls then drop into a reservoir. When a new baby starts developing, the angel Gabriel reaches into this container 
and takes a soul at random and puts it into the fetus so that it becomes alive inside the womb. Then Lila, the angel of conception, watches over the embryo until it's born. This tree of souls produces all the souls that have ever existed or will ever exist. The seventh heaven is also where the divine dew is stored which will be used to revive all the dead on the day of resurrection in order to be judged. Among the legends associated with these heavens is one about the world to come called Gan Eden or Paradise, the destination awaiting righteous souls. Paradise was said to have a double gate made of a precious stone called Carbuncle guarded by 600,000 angels. In the center of paradise stands the tree of life. It has 15,000 different tastes and aromas wafting everywhere. And under the tree, nestled in a canopy of stars, sits a rabbinic scholar who explains the Torah to all inhabitants of paradise. On your day one, as a fresh soul entering paradise, you will be offered by Archangel Michael to God on the altar in the temple of the heavenly Jerusalem, upon which you will be instantly transfigured into an angel. It is said that even the ugliest person becomes as beautiful and shining as the grains of a silver pomegranate upon which fall the rays of the sun. The angels that guard the gates of paradise will adorn you in seven clouds of glory and place upon your head a crown decorated with gems and pearls. Just when you think it can't possibly get any better, they will start leading you into your own personal garden containing 800 roses watered by many rivers, all while praising your righteousness during life. Each day you wake up a child and go to bed an elder, so that you get to enjoy the pleasures of childhood, youth, adulthood and old age each and every day. In each corner of paradise grows a vast evergreen forest made up of 800,000 trees, each of them is tended by one singing angel. This paradise is further divided into seven smaller paradises, each measuring 120,000 miles long and wide. Each one has its own entry requirement. The first paradise is made of glass and cedar and is dedicated for those who converted to Judaism from other faiths. The second is of silver and cedar and is reserved for penitents who confessed and repented their sins before death claimed them. The third paradise made of silver, gold, gems and pearls is dedicated for the patriarchs Moses and Aaron as well as the Israelites that escaped Egypt and lived for decades in the wilderness. The fourth paradise is made of rubies and olive wood and is dedicated for those who were the holiest and most steadfast in their faith. The fifth is like the third except for a river flowing through it and its canopy was woven by Eve herself with the help of her team of angels. This highly customized paradise was made to be the dwelling of the Messiah and Elijah. The sixth and seventh divisions are not described in detail, but the sixth is for those who died while doing a pious act, and the seventh for those who died from an illness, quote, in expiation for Israel's sins. This phrase refers to a concept in Jewish thought that the suffering and death of a righteous individual can atone for the sins of the entire nation of Israel. It's a concept similar to that of the scapegoat, where the sins of the masses are symbolically transferred to another being. It appears that people who die in such a way are in for a special place here. Beyond this magnificent realm and everything it contains lies the highest division of paradise. It's where God himself is enthroned and explains the Torah to its dwellers. Whether these descriptions are encoded allegories or that the ancient Hebrews actually believed this is what heaven looks like, it remains a scene fascinating to witness. 
Such intricate descriptions are the result of centuries of compound human thought and imagination. If heaven is somehow real, then it's truly a sight to behold. I had so much fun spending days in this fantastical realm of ancient cosmology, and I really hope you enjoyed it too. If so, please leave a like, it really helps the channel. If it's your first time here, I make videos about obscure history topics, ancient texts, medieval Europe, and mythology. If that's your thing by any chance, feel free to subscribe to enjoy future videos. For the meantime, why not check out this other video of mine, which YouTube thinks you may like too. Have an awesome evening, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.